I'm Tom Long. Welcome to Beach Meditations. Tomorrow is the third Sunday after Epiphany, year A in the lectionary. And I'm going to do something a little different uh, today because rather than just pick one of the readings and share my thoughts with regard to that, uh, I want to compare a couple of the readings. Uh, the Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 verses 12 through 23 and the Epistle reading is uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 10 through 18. And it's almost as though when Paul is addressing the issues in the Corinthian church with regard to their uh, division that um, he is looking back on what was going on in our gospel reading, uh, as particularly that little last part in verses uh, 17 and 18. So what was going on in the gospel reading? Well, what had happened uh, thus far was that uh, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness and he was uh, baptizing people with a baptism of repentance. He was calling them to repent of their sins and warning them that the kingdom of God was near. And uh, he was drawing quite a bit of attention. And the uh, scribes and the Pharisees even came out to be baptized. And, and uh, John the Baptist gave them the warm welcome of, well, who warned you, brood of vipers, to flee from the wrath to come? You know. Uh, not really <laughs> the, the greatest greeting, but it shows you that there was um, a tension between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, the, the kingdom of Rome and those uh, collaborators within God's people with the Roman Empire. So there's there's a tension that's there with John the Baptist and Herod the Tetrarch uh, has Herod imprisoned and Jesus learns of this after his own temptations directly with the devil out in, in the wilderness. So, you know, the, the 40 days and the 40 nights. So it seems as though the uh, powers of darkness are having their day, right? Uh, they've got John the Baptist in prison. Uh, Jesus has been uh, tempted. And now we come to the rest of the story because the, the gospel reading begins with Jesus uh, leaves his home in Nazareth and now he goes to um, Capernaum. And uh, Capernaum is described as being um, in the land of uh, uh, Naphtali and it's referring back to that uh, prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9 which is saying that um, that in, in the place of darkness in that northern kingdom that had been uh, overthrown by Assyria that uh, there would one day shine a great light and so now Jesus is the great light foretold back in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, <clears throat> now, what's interesting to me is that Capernaum is a populated area within the Tetrarchy of Herod. So Herod thinks, ha! John the Baptist is in jail, and, and, and more specifically, Herod's wife, who had, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of manipulated things to that point, uh, thinks that, hey, we've won. We've shut John the Baptist up. Nobody's out there telling people to repent and, and leave their sins behind, and especially nobody's telling me to do that anymore. Well, that's not the end of the story, is it? Because Jesus learns John the Baptist is in prison. He goes to Capernaum within Herod's region now, and he begins to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The story had not ended, had it? Now, to be fair, it didn't look like a whole lot of a threat because if you were there in those days, what would you have seen going on? Well, what you would have seen going on was the son of a Nazarene carpenter teaming up with four fishermen to go to Capernaum to start a movement against the kingdom of darkness. 
the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of God's people who were collaborating with Rome. And if you had any kind of common sense, you would look at that action, that provocation even, of Jesus going to Capernaum and think to yourself, well, that's not gonna end well for these guys. And in fact, of course, we know that Jesus ended up being put to death on the cross by the state in cooperation with the Roman collaborators within God's people. And Peter, you know, this firebrand, finds himself cowering around a fire saying, oh, I never, I never knew that guy. I wasn't hanging out with him. That wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. And at that point, you can see why looking at what Jesus was trying to do might appear to be foolishness. But Paul says in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of what? Be emptied of its power. For the messenger, message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So, when we look at what is going on from God's perspective, um, we see something very different than when we look at it from the perspective of those who are perishing, from the perspective of the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness, compared to the kingdom of the light, the great light that has come in fulfillment of Isaiah's promise. When you look at it from the perspective of the world, it's foolishness. These five young blue collar workers going off to start a movement against the greatest empire in history, against uh, traditional powers within their own culture that had been established for centuries. These five men go off and the only thing that one would see using common sense is that it's going to end badly for them. But God is at work. And so God empowers what they're doing. And even though it appears that they have lost on the third day, what happens? Well, we know. That's what Easter is all about. God raised Jesus from the grave in power. And that po the power of that resurrection then becomes available to all of us who look to Jesus for life and salvation. And so the powers of darkness, they thought they won, right? We got, we got rid of John the Baptist, in comes Jesus. They thought they won, we got rid of Jesus, we put him on a cross and we shut up, uh, we made Peter so afraid that he wouldn't even admit that he knew Jesus. And now Jesus rises from the dead and when they tell Peter to stop that preaching in uh, chapter uh, 5 of Acts, uh, how does Peter reply? He says, it's better to obey God than men. And they took note of his courage. Wow, what a transformation. Because the Holy Spirit that had come on Jesus in his baptism came down on the church at Pentecost. And Peter now had that power of the Holy Spirit. So the foolishness of the cross became the power of the gospel. And so when you look at things from the world's perspective, and frankly, sometimes from my own perspective, I look at my life and I think, uh, you know, I, I see the, the downside of it. Uh, we see the, the suffering that's involved, the ill health, the wounds from uh, relationships, the challenge, economic challenges. What, uh, there, there are people around the world who are um, living in fear of missiles flying through the air, in fear of starvation. Uh, there are p 
people in, in my own country who, because of the color of their skin, uh, even if they're just getting stopped for a speeding ticket, feel like their lives are at risk. Um, this, this is the real world. This is the way it is. But what the gospel reminds us of, that is not the whole story. Um, I think it's the best Marigold Hotel, that movie, where the, the uh, man that's a, a, the operator, uh, he's, he's basically in charge of running the, the hotel's business. And this, this young man uh, tells a, an older uh, visitor that um, things work out, everything works out in the end. If they haven't worked out, then it isn't the end. And that really is what Paul is saying here. Look, right now, what you believe may look like foolishness. Why? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you can't pay your bills. Maybe there's missiles flying overhead. Maybe you're persecuted because of your uh, color or your religion or where you came from. Maybe these things are true now, but it's not the end of the story. The end of the story is resurrection. The end of the story is power. The end of the story is the good news that God loves you so much that he sent his son to be an atonement for our sins so that we could be part, not just of a church or uh, a holy group of people, but that we could be part of God's family, that you and I and all of our fellow believers might be brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and children of the Lord, the King of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. To those who are perishing, it's foolishness. But to those who believe, it is hope. Thank you for hearing me out. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And uh, feel free to uh, add those to the comments here on YouTube.